Very pleased to be here. Appreciate uh, you guys staying to the end of the program. I know everyone's got places to be in dinner reservations. Um, whoever's got the best restaurant reservation, I'm going with you for dinner after, all right? So I'm going to check later. Yeah, I've never met a high mile who wasn't happier after cataract surgery. You'd think, just from an optical standpoint, younger in life, no, no lens changes, contact lens would give you the same vision, but pseudophagically, every mile, right? I'm seeing head shaking here. Every mile is happier after cataract surgery. These are, these are home runs, almost no matter what lens you put in, but this was great, brilliant choices by, uh, by the doctor on that. So we are not the world's experts in eye trace at Wills. We we're just really getting up to speed a lot on this. But as you might imagine, at Wills, we get referred a lot of problems. And we have patients who are getting all sorts of lenses and stuff going on in the community, and they're not happy. And they get sent into the great Wills for us to figure out what the problem is. And sometimes it's easy to figure out the problem is sometimes we need a little help. So what's really been great is the eye trace really gives us a lot of help. And you've heard a lot earlier about evaluating cataracts and uh, DLI and you know, how to plan your surgery and how to measure your accommodative range and, and the quality of the optical system you're dealing with. But what I'm really excited about with eye trace is how it can help me answer questions as to why I'm not happy and what's wrong with the vision there. So, um, I pushed the wrong button already. I'm doing great. All right, there we are. So we're gonna look at a case study here. This is a patient that, that, that came in that had a symphony toric placed and that's, you know, symphonies really came out of the gate really strong, really interesting technology. Uh, great advantages, but great ability to, to screw things up and have patients be unhappy. Um, I put a fair number of these in. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a consultant for J&J, &J, but I've been really happy with these results. Um, this is a 48-year-old who was seeking presbyopia relief. Um, a significant astigmatism, and we talked about this before, and you've heard this a zillion times, toric lenses far exceed your ability to correct optical issues compared to manual LRIs. So, you know, torics are really the way to go. This was a clear lens extraction performed elsewhere. Not we don't do clear lens extractions at Wills. Um, patient was complaining of two things, and let's and part of you know we don't do a lot of history in ophthalmology, but sometimes it's good to actually talk to the patient. Um, and this I know right kind of <clears throat> kind of crazy, but this patient was complaining of two things. They had two problems. They had dysphotopsias, which is glare halos, weird stuff going on, and they weren't happy with their vision. And Think about that a second. Take two steps back. That really is separable issues here. I can't see, I can see, but it's a but the visual quality is not good. And to the extent, yes sir? Can you grab the mic? Oh, you're not hearing me? I'm usually yeah. pretty damn loud. All right. Oh, okay. It's like Johnny Carson here. All right. Um, so separating out two, the, those two things is really important, especially these days with all the lenses that we have. So separating out dysphotopsias, which is poor quality of vision, from just poor vision, so poor visual acuity. And I think dissecting that out was very helpful to us in trying to figure out what was going on here. All right, so you know, the eye trace gives you a ton of data. You've heard all that all this evening here, and if you haven't, they'll, they'll tell you again. Um, you, can, you can look at wavefront, you can look at contrast, you can look at visual acuity, you can get really excellent uh, tracing refractions here. So you can look at all this, you can get a lot of uh, measurements in a row, so you can look for consistency in your data, which other machines don't give you really well. You can look at higher order aberrations. And one of the also important things, you look at optical alignment of your lens. And optical alignment is a couple things here. We're talking about toric lenses, so one of the really important things if you're gonna to put toric lenses of any sort, not just symphony, is what's the orientation? And this has been talked about a lot. Um, so you really need to know where the lens is in the eye. And if you have an issue, compare that to where the lens was supposed to be in the eye. So in terms of rotation of toric lenses, did you put it in in the right location? And did it stay in the right location? And then we can look at IOL uh, positioning in terms of centration. So for diffractive optic IOLs, more than for non-diffractive optic IOLs, centration along the visual axis is really important to both visual acuity and visual quality. So we can do all of that with the eye trace, so it's really important. So you can look at just topography, and these are beautiful topographies, way better than I get out of the Humphrey topographer in my office. This is far superior, far more consistent too, if you can get multiple measurements here. I mean, this is just clean, this tells us a lot. I know I have a pointer in here somewhere, but. Um, but you've all, you've all seen these pictures before, you know how to read it, I'm not gonna repeat that. But this is really very helpful here. So we can look at the topography, so we look, we can look at the cornea here, really awesome stuff here. Now we can look 
here at the wave front, and we can look at the refractions. You can see the tracy refractions here. And one of the things that should jump out at you here is this is a patient who had a symphony toric IOL. When you're looking at extended depth of focus or multifocal lenses, you want to have, and this is something I'm very near and dear to my heart, you want to minimize the residual refractive error, especially on the, on the astigmatic side. Stigmatism does not get enough respect. And we, we talk about it, and you can, you can sort of finesse it, and we can talk about extended depth of focus with, with the rule of stigmatism left on the table. But really, at the end of the day, you don't want to leave astigmatism with a diffractive IOL. You can see the Tracy refraction is showing that we have one and a quarter of residual refractive error and a stigma, astigmatic error. And that's, that, for me, is right there. That's a big red flag. All right? So right away, I'm looking at this going, all right, I know why this patient's not happy. All right? I, or one of the reasons, and it's really so clean as to have a single reason. It's usually multiple reasons. You know, is it, is it ocular surface? Is it an IOL selection? Is it residual astigmatism or spherical error? Is it centration? You know, there's often a lot of different things, and it, it gets a little tough to sort of sort that out and to explain cleanly the patient. But I'm already seeing here I'm not liking, I'm not liking that. So here, the average tracing refraction here, spherical equivalent is pretty good, but we have a fair bit of, uh, of astigmatism left on the table. And, and when, I, when I teach about symphony lens, and I do a lot of lecturing for J&J on symphony, you, to really get the results you want, you need to leave a half a diopter or less of, of cylinder. All right, half a diopter or less. And preferably, if you're going to leave half a diopter, leave it with the rule. But half a diopter or less. So leaving a diopter to a diopter in the quarter, while not the end of the world in terms of distance vision, truly impacts the near range. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. It's my buddy here in the third row. Yes, it affects. And one of the things I beat up J&J, even though they send me a check every so often, is that they rolled out the symphony lens as being very tolerant for residual astigmatism. And sure, it is tolerable if you look at the defocus curves on that. It is tolerable for distance vision, but it does a real number on your range. And when you can drive down that residual uh, uh, astigmatism on the symphony lens, your, your depth of focus explodes, literally explodes, which is what we want. All right, so the, so the tracer refraction matches a really good push plus refraction. And for symphony lenses, you need to push plus on your manual refractions. Do not use your auto refractor. Doesn't work. You can use the eye trace, it works beautifully, but not your auto refractive. Alright? So you look at the cornea and the lens of the DLI here, and we can we see where the uh, we see where the astigmatism is in the cornea, we knew that. Alright, so this is not a, a great surprise here. But we're seeing here internal, which is the lens, is this is where our issue is here. Okay? So we see our defocus there, and we know we have a problem there. So now I'm starting to smell a problem. You know, it was my were my calculations correct, or is this lens not where it's supposed to be? Okay. You can look at the chain analysis. It tells you that. You can see the residual astigmatism. And the astigmatism, the residual astigmatism is not what you want. And this is the key, this is the key screen here, all right? This is what we use a lot of wells when we're looking at, at these patients, all right? So you're looking at the internal wavefront, the corneal wavefront. So you're looking at the cylinder on the lens, which is right there. You're looking at the cylinder on the cornea, and these don't line up. Okay, this is not rocket science, beautiful stuff, not rocket science to most of us who do that. So we know we have a problem here. So this is pretty straightforward. This is a rotation of the lens. Um, and what's really beautiful about the eye trace is it's going to give you this right here. So you don't have to sit there with your iPhone with this astigmatism assistant app, which I've yet to figure out, which seems like a cool idea, but I can't get a good measurement. Um, and then go into the, uh, into the Bergdahl, Harden Bergdahl calculator. And do, this just gives it to you right there. It's really easy. You got it. You, you take these images, you've got your numbers here. I know what the problem is. Okay? So it's rotated 29 degrees. If I rotated it back where it's supposed to be, I'd get rid of all of that astigmatism. Wouldn't that be awesome? So is, so is my problem solved? Maybe. No? You don't think so, huh? Did you see this talk already? No? All right. The problem's not solved. I've done a lot of okay, so yeah, so the problem the problem is it may be solved, it may not be solved. Don't think this is the whole story here. However, you this is something that you don't want. So you know that if you fix this, you're going to make the patient better. The question is, are you going to fix the entire problem? Maybe you will, maybe you don't. Let's look. All right, let's look. So and that may not seem a lot, but that's a lot. So toric stability study. Uh, David Chang had a study that came out that Alcon is using to beat J and J up with a club. Um, 
you know, Technix lenses are not as tacky as Alcon lenses. They may rotate a little bit more. Um, I personally feel that you can get them not to rotate by better implantation techniques, but theoretically they could. Um, you need to be able to deal with that. Um, most torques rotate in the first hour. They probably do. The question is whether they rotate because their chamber uh, shallows a little bit, they rub the eye, or the wound's not perfect. I know some surgeons who put a suture in every toric patient to prevent that uh, from occurring. That may help. They definitely, ret they definitely rotate within the first day or two. Um, the best way to measure them is with the eye trace toric check. It's great. You have this in the office. You run the, all your toric patients through this. You know the number. Now, in defense of the Technus platform, just because they're rotated does not mean their vision's bad. Because the optics of the Technus are different than the optics of the Alcon lens. And at the end of the day, you want to address the visual quality, not the rotation. So if the rotation is not affecting the vision, no need to go back into the OR. If it is, then you should go back to the OR. So that's a small aside here. Um, when you're doing, when you're rotating, the best time to rotate is two to four weeks. You want to let the capsular bag contract a little bit. You want to make sure that the rotation is stable. It will be stable at that point. You don't want to wait too much longer, although you could. This is probably pretty ideal. And just as an aside for, the, for those of you in the room who do this stuff, I don't use viscoelastic when I, re, when I reposition them. I use an anterior chamber maintainer or bimanual because you don't want to put viscoelastic in again and then have to take it out and then have the lens shift again. You know, that's your, it's a circular sort of problem here. So it's really easy to, you know, two to four weeks this lens is going to move easily under BSS. You don't need viscoelastics. And just have an anterior chamber maintainer or, or a bimanual setup, and you can nudge the lens in the direction you want to go. And having that in the slide that we showed, you know exactly how many degrees from where it is that you have to move. You can put your, your uh, Dell marker on the cornea at that point and mark out your, and I think it said 29 degrees, mark out your 29 degrees, and you know exactly where it has to be. So you can put it there. And, you know, the lens is not going to move the second time for sure because the capsular bag's contracted a bit now at this point, and it should be fine. You don't usually need to open the leaves of the capsule. Um, that's only if it's been in there longer and it's fibrous down. So we, we wrote this around and the lens is in perfect condition and the patient sees 20-20. Have we, have we cured their entire problem? And the answer is we haven't cured their entire problem because we had two separate problems. We had a lack of 20-20 vision and we had dysphotopsias or a lack of quality vision or visual aberrations. And the poor visual acuity is from the misrotation of the lens. The dysphotopsias are from the fact that in this particular case we're going to look here and we're going to look at our we're going to look at our angle alpha, which is the number down here. So everyone knows angle alpha, angle kappa, and since George Waring's not here, I don't have to talk about chord mu. But um, for those of us who are not as smart as he and some of and some of the other fine brains that, that have developed all this, I'm just a poor humble country doctor. Um, angle alpha is really what we want to concentrate on, which is the deviation between the center of the capsular bag and the visual axis. Because these lenses were designed to center themselves in the capsular bag. And we all go in there and we try and center it on the second Purkinje image, which is, we think is the visual axis, and we hope it stays there. Most of the time it won't stay there. It will recenter when you leave the OR in the center of the capsular bag, as it was designed to. Um, and in most patients, the deviation, the angle alpha, the separation between the center of the capsular bag, which is where the lens is, and the, uh, and the visual axis is pretty small. And we don't have too much of a problem with that. And the symphony is not, doesn't usually have a problem with that because it's not, a refractive op it's not a refractive zonular lens. It's a diffractive optic. The entire optic is a single diffractive lens. So decentration is not as much of an issue. But if you decenter enough, it becomes an issue. So we look here and we look at angle alpha, and this is clearly a number. So 0.4 is usually the number we use. Ray, what do you think? About 0.4, that's what we use about. So you don't want to see deviations more than 0.4 because you're then you're going to start to look for trouble here. And this is 0.6, and, and the eye trace will give you this. You don't have to do anything fancy here. I mean, Ray's given me a slide here that, that, that he's, he's drawn out the rings of the, of the symphony so we can find the optical center here. You don't have to do all that. It'll give you these numbers, and you can look at that and go, all right, so maybe this was not a great patient to have put any sort of diffractive, forget symphony or active, active focus or, or MTF, uh, TMF. Um, so maybe this was not a patient to use a diffractive lens on. You know, I found, and certainly I, I do use the point four, and, I, and when I, I look at patients and I evaluate them for, for lens choices, if they, have, if they have high coma 
and if they have a high angle alpha, I try to push them away from, the, from a diffractive optic IOL. Um, in real life on the ground, it's probably not as, as universally applicable, but I think if you're gonna be prudent about it, that if you saw this number pre-op, you might say to the patient, maybe this is not the lens for you. But we found here that this patient has that, so even if we rotate their lens, we're gonna improve them for sure, but we're not gonna make them perfect. And the question is how much dysphotopsia, and one of the things we yet don't have is a way to judge quality of, or quantity of dysphotopsia. Dysphotopsia is this sort of global term that we throw around for patients not liking their vision. You know, you look at them, they're 20, 20, they're plano, you know, doc, and you're sitting there going, you're great. And they go, doc, I'm miserable. You know, I have, I have glare, I have halos, I have spider webs, I have starbursts, I have whatever. And they're like, well, you, you know, I have crescents, you know, you have positive dysphotopsias, negative dysphotopsias, you know, I can send you out to Sam Maskett's office and he can do God knows what with you. But we don't have a really good way of quantifying what's causing that and exactly how bad it is. We, it's a subjective response. But what we can do is we're trying to cone down, and I have this conversation on the J&J &J side all the time, how do we cone down, what are the factors, what's the thing we need to be screening patients for so we don't create this issue in our patients? And we look at you know, tear film, cornea, EBMD, you know, retinal issues, um, we can look at angle alpha, we can look at a whole variety of things and we can try and minimize it. I don't think we have the final answer here because we're still, a, we have great results. And the vast majority of my patients are super happy, but I don't feel like I've got the perfect way of making sure I never have another patient with debilitating dysphotopsias. But what the eye trace will tell you, and what this is really good for, it's good for you in pre-op evaluation, of course, but again, as a consultative center, this has been really, really helpful in helping us answer the questions like, no one could tell me what's wrong, doc. I came here so you can tell me what's wrong. And I can say, all right, you know, what's wrong is your lens needs to be repositioned, that'll help, but I'm gonna tell you right up front, it's not gonna make you perfect, and maybe you should talk about a lens exchange instead of a reposition. And that's a tough, I'm not here to answer that one by a long shot, but, um, but you know, you can get all this really helpful data, and the more ways we have of evaluating the patient's visual sim the system and being able to sort patients to the right IOL, we're gonna have much happier patients, and as a result, we're gonna have happier wives, and we're gonna have a happier career in general. Because the one thing none of us as character students wanna do, you don't wanna walk into the, into, the, uh, into the exam room on a 24 hour post off and have the patient be unhappy. You wanna walk in and you wanna be a hero, a genius. Um, and it's, what's great is that we have the technology to do that a really high percentage of the time. But we're greedy, we want it even more. So, so I think this really is very helpful. If you haven't used it this way, this is a great way to use iTrace. It really sells itself for me as a technology that in, is a premium practice that wants to grow our, my premium business. I, you know, I need to see this stuff. So hope this was helpful. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you very much.